Um, so I'd like to introduce Ella Olfri, who will be in conversation with Nadifa Mohammed. Ella Olfri is deputy editor of Granta, and before joining Granta, she was senior editor at Jonathan Cape, which is a random house company. She sits on the board of the Writer Center Norwich and is deputy chair of the Council of the Kane Prize and a patron of the new Eti Salat Prize for Literature, which was recently inaugurated in Lagos, Nigeria. In, two, in 2011, she was on the judging panel of both the David Cohen Prize and the Kane Prize for African Writing. And in 2012, she was chair of the fiction panel for the Bogus Prize for Caribbean Literature. Her journalism has appeared in The Telegraph and The Observer, and she's a contributor to the book pages of NPR. Her introduction to Woman of the Aeroplanes by Kojo Lane, which was published by Pearson as part of the African Writers Series, was published in 2012. A fellow of the Royal Society of the Arts, Ella Offrey was awarded an OBE in England in 2011 for services to the publishing industry. She will now introduce Nadifa Mohammed, and welcome to the second session. Angela, thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me. I do want to start off um, thanking Angela and Billy and the team at Kwani for co-hosting the workshops and um, the series of events this week with us. And to give a massive thanks to the British Council for flying us here, for taking care of us, and also for helping us you know, gather such an audience. And my thanks to you all for being here this evening. I'd like to introduce Nadifa Mohammed. She was born in Hagesa in what is now called the Republic of Somaliland. In 1986, Nadifa moved with her family to England, and the outbreak of war meant that they ended up staying. Educated in London and at Oxford University, she published her first novel in 2009. This gloriously original debut is a semi-biographical account of Nadifa's father's life. The novel won the prestigious Betty Trask Prize in 2010 and went on to be shortlisted for numerous awards, including the Guardian First Book Award. The book was also longlisted for the Orange Prize for Fiction. This year, Nadifa has been selected as one of 20 young writers named by Granta Magazine as the best of young British novelists. It's the fourth incarnation of a list that's published only once every 10 years, highlighting the work of what we think are the very best writers working in England today. Her second book, The Orchard of Lost Souls, will be published this August. And please, another round of applause for Nadifa Mohammed. <laughs> Nadifa, as I said in my introduction, Black Mamba Boy, your first book, is based on the life of your father. Can you give the audience a sense of the story and talk a little bit about what motivated you to write it? Yes, it's um, a very closely based account of my father's early life in East Africa in the Middle East. He's 88 now, and um, I always grew up hearing snippets of these stories. So he said, oh, I was once locked up in a, I was once imprisoned with a tortoise. You know, <laughs> you don't have any context for that. Another time he said that he'd waded across the Red Sea. Another time he said that he'd fought in the Second World War. So I grew up with these stories, but I never made any sense of them. And as I got older, um, I wanted to, there, were, there was lots of things going on around that time, and part of me was interested in finding out more about my background. And I was also working on a film script about a Somali man who'd been executed for a murder he didn't commit in 1952. This man, Mahmoud Matan, was a friend of my father's. They knew each other, they were part of this kind of very um, peripatetic Somali male world. And um, I just wanted to find out more about Mahmoud Matan. So my father was like, oh, he's not very interesting. I'm the interesting small, one. Small dad. And then he started telling me in detail his own life story from his childhood, his early childhood in Yemen, living on the streets. Then he, was, he went back to Somalia, and then he, he went to Eritrea, and he, he was an office boy for an Italian fascist soldier. And then he did fight in the Second World War and survived and deserted the army and became a farmer, then a troubadour, wandering around with a Rababa, an Eritrean Sudanese instrument. And then he eventually joined up with the British Merchant Navy, and his first job was on a prison ship, taking Jewish refugees trying to enter Palestine back to Europe. And that's how he ended up in the UK. So a lot of us spend time with our parents and grandparents and hear these interesting stories. Um, very few turned them into prize-winning books. What made you think that 
this was a story that you wanted other people to hear? Because it was a story I wanted to hear. And I, I, I could, I'd never found anything that touched on this time, these sorts of people, something so close to me before. It was unique, the mm -hmm. story that my father was telling me. And the sort of surreal aspects of it meant that another person's account wouldn't be able to substitute for it. Not many people would say that they've waded across the Red Sea. No. So no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's, it's uniqueness and it's weirdness kept me going, kept me excited, kept me interested. At that point, um, when you were thinking about this, had you, had you thought maybe you might make a film? Did you think you were a writer? Had you Not at all. I didn't know what I was. I left university and didn't know what I wanted to do. And I just stumbled into a film job doing research and then doing a bit of script writing. So I didn't know what would happen, especially the story. I just thought maybe I just needed to put it down. That's mm. all I knew. Mm. At first it was meant to be a biography, and then it became a novel. Then it became a novel that I think maybe I could publish. So there was no end point, really. There was no goal that I was working towards. It was just one, one step after another. The, the book has, has sort of somewhat unusually had a sort of wonderful critical reception, as well as sort of popular reception. People want to read the book. And I know you said a little bit that you wrote this because you thought you wanted to read the story. Mm. But there, there have to be things about the story of your father and the way that you told it that, that mean that people internationally feel that they can connect with it. What are the things that you'd pull out that you'd think makes it meaningful for a whole range of readers? It's hard to tell. It's hard to tell. Otherwise, everyone would bottle it and <laughs> make sure that every book had it. But it was interesting, um, the book was actually really popular in Korea. I didn't expect that. And um, Koreans have also had a, a hard history, and they've got this concept of Han, which is what I've heard is kind of like blues slash soul, mm -hmm. and things that, things that are imbued with, with, with a certain kind of sadness that are appreciated in Korea. So I think there is this sadness, and, but there's also um, lots of love in the book. It's a celebratory book, mm -hmm. and it tells the story of a time that not many people know anything about. And it's an adventure. And it's an adventure. It's a boy's adventure. Nadifa, will you read to us from Black Mamba Boy? Yes. So the passage I'm going to read from is um, in Djibouti. He's started already his journey to find his father. He doesn't have a mother, so he's decided to find this long-lost father of his, who is rumored to be in, in Sudan or Eritrea, and he's depending now on the, on the kindness of strangers. But they're not really strangers, they're, they are his clan's people, they're the people that are related to him through clan. And by kind of obligation, they, they look after him, they give him money, they give him food, they give him shelter. So he's just leaving a possible family that could have adopted him. He's about 11 years old here, and this wonderful family, Idea and I, Amina, who live in Djibouti, Djibouti town, want him to stay, but he refuses. He wants to find his father. Okay. Old creaky pilgrims with red beards and white shrouds piled into a small, small dhow. The captain waved him over with an expansive sweep of his hand. Idea waited at the top of the gangplank. I wish I could make you stay. But this will have to be goodbye for a while, I guess. Learn how to read Jama. I was hoping to teach you while you, was, while you stayed with us. But what have you been doing in Sudan? Why did he not come back for me? Jama felt ready to explode. His sentence was finally over. Imagine yourself into the skin of a boy, an 11-year-old boy in the 30s in another part of the world. It was very frightening at first. It was a daunting kind of prospect. And the way I kind of built up to it was by doing lots of research so I could get the landscape right in my head. The actual boy himself, um, is somewhere, he's a character of his own, but there's some of me in him, there's some of my father in him. You spoke um, <coughs> a little bit about the research, but it seems to me that you, it's, it's worn very lightly in your book. Mm -hmm. At the same time, as well as having experienced a glorious adventure when I finished reading Black Mamba Boy, I also felt that I was thinking about Somalia and people who come from it in a different way. And, you know, I'd, I'd like to think I'm sort of quite aware of what's happening in the world. Yeah. But I realized that actually I had one way of thinking of Somalia and Somalis. Do you, is that something that you wanted to happen or do you think it's just an accident that, that happens through good fiction? It's a good question. Um, I wouldn't say it was one of the motivations I had earlier on. And 
it was it was all it was all new to me. So I was learning something. It wasn't something that I knew that I was trying to tell other people. I was learning lots on the way. And wh whenever I see old Somali men, particularly, but also women, um, when they tell you, I've, I've got a music teacher now who's 85, and he'll just break into the conversation. I was in Siberia being trained by the Red Army. <laughs> it's like, when, where, why? Mm -hmm. And then he'll slowly kind of say, oh, yes, yes, I was there for two years and they used to bash um, beer bottles over my head. So there's, a, there's tragedy and, you know, this surreal, surrealness to it as well. Yeah. So there's a lot, there's, there's great storytellers, if nothing else. Mm. So it'd be a shame if other people were deprived of that. There's a bit in, in the book where you say, I will be my father's career. Mm. Um, tell me about that. I think that was probably a deep, I had that feeling earlier on, but I couldn't, I didn't know how to put it. And actually phrasing it that way came very late mm -hmm. when I was writing the novel, but that's what I was trying to do. I was saying I was celebrating his life and celebrating the fact that he wasn't, he's not meant to be here, he's not meant to have had a good life, the way he started out. Mm. You know, he, he left so many other people behind. And so I am agree on, not just for him, but for those who he left behind as well. Like, he can talk very movingly about the people he knew and he's one of a, he's one of very few. Yeah. Um, the book for me ends up being a gift for him, but a gift for the rest of us as well, really. I hope so. Yeah. Um, your second book, The Orchard of Lost Souls, is um, also set in Somalia. It's a very different time mm. and a different setting, and it's told by three protagonists. Can you tell us a little bit about the second book yes. and that decision to go back to Somalia? I think there was no decision. I, if you'd asked me before I'd written Black Lama Boy, what would I write about? I probably would have said the Somali Civil War, because it, is, it was still so, felt so urgent and and raw and I wanted to, I was reading all these kind of uh, reports by NGOs and uh, in newspapers about the, the tra you know, the terrible things that were going on. So it overwhelms you, it's constantly in your mind. And then I wrote Black Mamba Boy and I came back to that idea. And people don't, often don't realise that the war didn't begin in Mogadishu, it began in the north of the country in, in the late 80s. And that the country wasn't really a country towards the end. It was, it was just, you know, dying. It was a dying country. So I wanted to go back to the town that I was born in, and I was influenced by family stories, you know, my grandmother's story and some of my mother's stories. Um, so I was looking at the war, but from a very personal and small viewpoint, not this big, you know, so much has happened in the last 20 years, yeah. 25 years in Somalia, so you can't digest all of it. But from this small, small uh, perspective, I, I, I could, you know, tease out some of the things that I found important. Mm. Um, the book isn't published yet, but in Grant is Best of Young British Novelists, we published an extract from the book, and I'd like to invite you to mm -hmm. introduce us to one of the characters in the, from The Orchard of Lost Souls. Okay. <laughs> this is Filson. She's a young woman, a well-educated young woman from Mogadishu. She works for the government in the security forces, and she's come up to Hagesa uh, to really kind of um, help her career. So she's, she's a very isolated young woman. Filson rises and takes her uniform from the peg on the door. She is up 10 minutes before the alarm, but doesn't want to remain with her thoughts, simultaneously mulling over everything and nothing. She pulls her tunic over her head and her trousers over her legs. A quick visit to the bathroom, and then she is beside the stove in the communal kitchen, the wall above her blackened with soot, the smell of meat and ghee still in the air from the previous night. Water boils in her saucepan, tea leaves, cardamom pod pods, and clothes, cloves shivering on the surface of it. As it's about to bubble over, she grabs the handle and pours just enough to fill her enamel cup. She drinks the tea immediately, its heat scorching her throat in a way she finds pleasant. This is the entirety of her breakfast. Back home, her housekeeper intercepts would have covered the dining table with a vinyl sheet decorated with small yellow flowers and laid out a flask of black tea, a jug of orange juice, a fruit salad of mangoes, papayas and bananas, a plate full of lahore hidden under a domed fly guard, and if her father had requested it, night, it the night before, scrambled eggs and lamb kidneys. The other women, there are about 50 altogether in the barracks, drift into the kitchen, while Filson nurses her empty cup and gazes at the view beyond the, win beyond the window, a bare yard crisscrossed by poles and clotheslines, 
the two domes of the central mosque on the horizon. Breeze blocks, abandoned when the nearly completed hotel was commandeered by the, by the military, have become another kind of barracks, for cooing pigeons beneath the window. She ignores her comrades as they ignore her. But what would she say to them if she could? She would tell them that she's never been good at making friends, that Intisada's children had seemed kind, but hadn't been allowed inside the house by her father, that the neighborhood kids had scorned her, that she found it easier to talk to her father's friends, that her face was closed because she didn't know how to open it. Silence takes the place of all these words, and her loneliness remains as dense and close as a shadow. Hilson rinses her cup, blocks it away, and returns to her room to make the bed before departing for the offices of the mobile military court. She hears laughter from the kitchen as she turns the handle to the door and she knows it is aimed at her. As she enters, she finds herself overwhelmed by an urge to wail, her blood suddenly darkening with self-loathing and anger that her life should be so small and inconsequential that this two meter by two meter cell that is her room should be the span of her world. The offices of the mobile military court are in an old colonial complex. The brick chimney jutting out from one of the rooftops is something Filson had never seen in Mogadishu, where the weather was, ne was never less than sultry. But, the, but here the wind is so cold and fierce at times that it's not hard to imagine an Englishman dozing by a fire with a long-haired dog at his feet. In her Spartan office there are just two desks, one for Captain Yasin and a small scratched one for her, Corporal Adam Ali. She is an office worker, neither noticed nor commended by the uniformed men above her, and it galls her that despite two years of enlistment in the Women's Auxiliary Corps and five years working for the Victory Pioneers in Mogadishu, her chief tasks are still those of a secretary. Had her father been dreaming or lying when he told her that she would make the ground shake in Hargeisa? Had he been drunk or just desperate to remove her from Mogadishu in case the suspicion around him became something more tangible and sinister? In the notes sent from the agents to her desk, she sees how difficult, difficult it is to interpret someone's actions, intentions, words. If she had to create a dossier on her own unknowable father, where would she even begin? He had shown her both tenderness and contempt, cruelty, yet honor, a glimpse of the world through the bars of his love. She sees him now, pacing the flat roof of their three-story villa in Mogadishu, a strip of the Indian Ocean visible between two slender minarets, watching over the neighborhood with binoculars, scanning east and west for the spies he believes watch him. Captain Yasin arrives, tall and elegant in his black beret. With just the two of them in the office, she cannot help but watch him all day, his regular strolls around the room and into the corridor, the private calls he makes on the only telephone line in their department, the menthol cigarette butt slowly filling his dark glass ashtray, the tin of mints he rattles absentmindedly when frowning over some report. Wilson stands up and salutes him, and he waves her back to her chair. Now don't get too excited, Miss Corporal, but I spoke to Major Addo a few days ago, and he asked me if I could recommend a graduate to go on a mission to the border. I looked high and low, and then I remembered you, crouched over your little desk. Such efficiency, such honesty. Wilson looks up at him with half contempt, half desire. To Birchek with you, on the double, he points dramatically to the door, and she laughs despite herself. As she leaves the room, his eyes track her with an interest she doesn't find unwelcome. Um, I have two questions uh, in relation to Mama Boy. Um, first, your, your, should I call him drama or your father? I'm, I'm conflicted, but I guess both are right. Um, married an uh, Eritrean woman and had a boy to best of my recollection. Um, I can find it. Um, um, what happened to that marriage? And what happened to that marriage? Uh, it kind of disappears from the story. What happened to the... To that, to that marriage that happened in Eritrea. It, it kind of disappeared. Mm -hmm. um, second, toward the conclusion, I think, you talked about your mother and that your second book is going to be tribute to her. Um, much as I'm looking forward to August and reading your next book, um, <coughs> when is your mother's story going to come? Okay. Um, firstly, he marries Bethlehem in Eritrea, and Bethlehem is a figment of my imagination. 
So um, he did get married much later on, but not in Eritrea. So it was, I wrote, I introduced Bethlehem to the story after this kind of horrible scene in the middle where his friend is killed um, by the Italian soldiers. And I couldn't write any more sad things. I couldn't write any more violence. So Bethlehem is a rest for me and a rest for him. She was just a way of bringing love back into his life. My second book, I say, is the book that is inspired by my mother. I interviewed her at the beginning of it, and she was very adamant that she had nothing interesting to say. She was just a Hargeisa housewife, and she, you know, she's not done anything interesting. But she had, and she, you know, it's through her sort of, um, stories that I found out what it was like the night that the Somali flag went up for the first time, and the big parties that happened around that, and you know, all of the that whole kind of um, trajectory from independence to the civil war, I, I learned that from my mother, how it mm. felt for an ordinary person. This was a very interesting uh, conversation. Um, it's, it's quite a pleasure to listen to both of you um, talk about the, the work. I'm just wondering, the question is to both of you. Um, I remember a friend of mine talk, telling me she did a postgraduate course at the University of Edinburgh, and one of the, uh, she studied a course on contemporary British writers. And on the, on the list, there was Rushdie, there was Okri, and I'm thinking the list goes on now with, uh, with people like Nadifa, Nadifa Mohammed. Um, you, you've got people from uh, diasporic voices from Asia, Africa, mm -hmm. as British writers. Do you think that we are beginning to see a shift in the, what um, you would call British literature? Hmm. I think it's been something that's, that shift has been going on for a long time. It started around Sam Rushdie in, in the 80s and the empire writing back. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's exploded now. So it's not just a few big countries. There's lots of smaller countries as well having their voice heard and having their stories told. So um, what I found really interesting about the list, um, the best of, young, best of young British novelists list that Grant, that Grant put together, was that it, there wasn't a sense of tokenism, that you had to have one, one person to show that there's an alternative voice of British literature. It's actually, there's a lot of voices. And before, it wasn't really, people didn't, everything was happening separately. So you had a bunch of African writers here, a bunch of Asian writers there, a bunch of maybe Northern writers here, Scottish writers. And none of it felt like it was pulled together as this is like a, you know, this is, a, this is what British literature sounds like and looks like at the moment. So the grantor list put spotlights on that, on that situation and has kind of gathered everyone together. So I, I'd never done any talks with Adam before and it's brought me and you know, so many diverse people together so that we can discuss things. And I didn't know that he'd written a book about Kenya. And I found that really fascinating and I, I'm, I'm excited about that. Nadif is referring to Adam Fold, who's um, also traveling with us and is also on the Best of Young British Novelist list. Um, I love the, the, the fact that you were named, the names you were um, talking about in your question, Ben Okri, Saman Rushdie, they are granted her Best of Young British Novelists. And so this is not the first time that we've had people. And I think really when we talk about sort of, you know, the Dash Forces, we're saying that these are British writers who are not white. And it's, it's when we think, when, so as Nadif is saying, when the writers get together, they haven't, as far as I'm concerned, they don't look around and say, oh, what a diverse bunch we are. It's sort of, you know, oh, I really loved your book and, you know, it was really interesting you were writing about that. And I think for many readers, that is how reading is happening now. Mm. People don't necessarily feel that a book by Salman Rushdie or Rohan Mystery is foreign. A book by Ben Oakley is a book by a British Nigerian writer. And so I think some of the labels and the differentiation that we put comes from critics and so on, but not from the reading public. And to my mind, in the end, that reading pub public is really what's important. And yes, the truth is that they are more people who are the children of immigrants themselves, or maybe the grandchildren of immigrants in some cases, who are now writing right at the top of the game in the English language and from Britain. And it has to be a thing that's only of great benefit to us readers. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yes, there's a, a lady down here. Okay, we, we met earlier in the day. I've started reading your book and it's lovely, the language is great, the, it, it's just a nice book. So I'm not asking a question, I'm just as, have a request that you read the, the, the second paragraph of the book where you say, I am my father's griot. Yeah, until, you know, until the end of that paragraph on page two, if I'll you do don't that. mind. Can I do that at the end? Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Especially the fathers. 
Maybe it's easier with the mothers, but the fathers uh, rarely talk with their children about their adventure and all those things. They consider, they think that it's maybe too complicated for them to understand. Mm. And uh, I think it's after, many of us now after reading your book, we have been inspired to talk to our children and tell them our story because many Somalis came through this kind of adventure like your father, like Jama. And I think hoping that one day they might grow up to be writers and write about us. 